Hello, everyone. My name is Joanne Lockwood, and I'm your host for the Inclusion Bytes podcast. In this series, I've interviewed a number of amazing people and simply had a conversation around the subject of inclusion, belonging, and generally making the world a better place for everyone to thrive. If you'd like to join me in the future, then please do drop me a line to joe.lockwood at cchangehappen.co.uk. That's S-double-E, changehappen.co.uk. You can catch up with all of the previous shows on iTunes, Spotify, and their usual places. So plug in your headphones, grab a decaf, and let's get going. Today is episode 51 with the title, Peeling Back Our Layers to Uncover Our Essence. And I have the absolute honor and privilege to be joined by Michelle Mills Porter. Michelle describes herself as a specialist in human communication and behavior. When I asked Michelle to describe her superpower, she said, it is being able to see the potential in people and help them align to it. Michelle is known as the people reader. Hello, Michelle. Welcome to the show. Hello, Joanne. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. We've been talking about uh, having this conversation for, for, for months, and I'm finally pleased we managed to get, get uh, time together. So, Michelle, we were talking before I pressed the record button uh, in, the, in the green room before we were talking about essence. So what, tell me about peeling back our layers to uncover our essence. What do you mean by that? Well, it sounds incredibly painful, doesn't it, Joanne? But I promise it's really not. Um, it's something that I came across. I thought that I knew about human behaviour. Um, I thought I was quite good at all that stuff. When I was in a serious amount of adversity. I was caught in the Boxing Day tsunami. And it was the aftermath of that that I suddenly realised that I didn't know as much as I thought. And the reason that I realised that was because people that I knew were doing things that I didn't expect them to do and behaving in different ways. And I realised they were being driven by something that I wasn't necessarily aware of. And that's, it took me a very long time to actually research it and dig deep and, and try and work backwards and find out what this, this is. Um, and it, it literally took years and years for me to realise that what I'm talking about is our core driving forces. And that is subconscious. So when I talk about peeling our, our layers back, what I'm talking about is actually getting to the subconscious and finding out what truly drives people. And that's where our essence lies, Joanne. It's fascinating. So you were actually in the the ground zero of the tsunami back in, was it 19, no, 2004, wasn't it? It was 2004, Boxing Day 2004. And yes, um, we were in Sri Lanka. I was over in Sri Lanka with a, a team of, um, of people from our dive centre, our local dive centre, and there were 14 of us. So we went over to Sri Lanka together. And we were caught smack bang in the middle of it. And I I realise now, and you always see clearly with hindsight, don't you? And what I realise is it, it's, it's in those spikes of adversity that we see the true potential of humanity. And they're massive learning uh, lessons, huge lessons. And so, you know, when I got back after the tsunami, um, I just thought this is too big for me to not make it my priority so you know I kind of turned my back on my very successful business and everything else that I'd been doing and completely changed the direction of my life to try and understand and make sense of what I'd learned and then turn it into lessons for other people so that they could have the benefit of those lessons without having to go through the kind of horrendous lessons that that we've been through. So what was one of the, the key things that surprised you about yourself? So presumably the first person you observe is yourself, isn't it? And how you, what, what layers of onion did you have that you didn't realise you had? Oh my gosh, do you know what? I think the first thing I did, now let's imagine I'm on the third floor of my hotel room and I'm asleep and we can hear what sounds like a storm outside. Now, I've already been up for breakfast. I've gone back for a kip, you know, but we knew that it was a beautiful day. So we can't work out why it sounds like there's a storm outside. We can hear this gushing water and it sounds like torrential rain. So 
Stuart gets up and he pulls the curtain back and he immediately says, um, I think you better come and look at this. And I could tell from his voice that something was wrong. So I shot out of bed and I saw and looked out the window and saw that we were surrounded by water. Now, this is the key thing, Joe. The first thing I did was I went, wow. And I grabbed my video camera. Now, I really battle with that because I grabbed my video camera and I started pointing it out the window, trying to capture this amazing and scary and, and exciting thing. And all of these emotions came up. And then I tried to justify having a video camera in my hands by saying, I'm recording this in case the owner of the dive centre needs this as evidence for his insurance or whatever. And as I as I kind of came to, within split seconds, my thought then was, who can I help? Who needs help? And I was really embarrassed that that wasn't the first thought, that my first thought was, wow, this is incredible. I've got to capture it on camera. Actually, it wasn't until more than 10 years later that I created my own analysis that captures these things, that I understand my main driving force is this ability to see awe and wonder in nearly everything. And it's kind of justified it for me. Should I have thought of who I can help first? No. What we have to do is we have to understand who we truly are. And we have to be at peace with that. So if my first action was to grab a video camera and tape it, just accept that. Your second um, reaction was to to wonder if anyone needed help. That's good. That's good enough to be second best. So I stopped beating myself up as soon as I understood what that was all about. And it, it really did take me t- to design this analysis tool to be able to forgive myself for that. I'm just trying to imagine opening those curtains and looking out the window. And I can, I, I can almost feel, as you, as you said, you, you were, in the moment, you, went, you, you became a reporter. You were reporting on something that was unusual. You were reacting to it in that way. It's only after it permeated into your, into your thoughts, you became a responder. So you went from reporter to responder quite quickly. Yeah, but the first exactly. thing was, wow, this is different. I've never seen anything like this before. Um, I don't know if I see anything again. I, I, I don't know. At that point, the first moment, you didn't feel in danger. You didn't perceive other people in danger. It's only when maybe it soaked in that the true reality of what happened, because otherwise it just looked like a, a bit of a flood. Maybe a, a, well, a, a yeah. Big, I mean, we were we were thirty foot underwater by then, so it was a, a pretty serious flood. And you know, the dive center was covered. the The roof was being carried off by the water. We couldn't see anything as far as the eye could see, apart from water. Even inland, it was just horrific. There were ships being banged into the side of the hotel. I mean, it was you know, it was really bizarre. But I think the feelings are something that I battled with. You know, what do I feel? I feel horror. I feel shock. I feel excitement. I feel awe. I feel all of these things. And it's a mixture of emotions. And do you know what, Joanne? I recognise it. When I see the headline of news or the headlines in a paper, I sometimes feel excitement first. And that used to repulse me. If I see this horrific, and there was something horrendous that happened on the news this morning, several people have been killed. And I, the first reaction is, oh my gosh, people have been killed. And it's a mixture of whether is that, that's horrific, but it's also exciting. And I don't want that to come across in the wrong way. But if we start overly trying to justify our feelings you know we we're not true to ourselves that is a thing it is a thing and that's why reporters use headlines to drag people in really quickly so to fight who we naturally are is the wrong thing to do to understand it and work with it is the right thing to do mm. so i remember i remember that boxing day i was at my brother's with my two young children my wife with my brother, his wife and his two young children. I remember sitting there on Boxing Day watching this unfold and and it needed the reporter on the ground who had that footage. This is, I mean, this is before the level of communication we've got now with our phones. I mean, 2004 is what, uh, 
16, 17 years ago, yeah. 17 years ago this year. Mm -hmm. We think of technology now, but it, technology didn't exist. We didn't have kind of the mobile phones we did. We didn't have the internet connections we did. So, yeah, I think it was important to, to see that early reporting because how could I, as someone so remote, get a feeling for the devastation? And I then became very involved in fundraising activities to send money out to, as you say, Sri Lanka, India, and, and other affected places through the network I was a member at the time. But we, it was that footage, I think, that motivated the public around the world. So it, it was essential to have people reporting it. But that's really interesting that you... Yeah, you're going, yeah, but I'm I'm just going to jump in. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Joe, but I just I feel so passionate about this. When you're in it, how anyone holding a camera is the most disrespectful thing that you can do. So there's a real dilemma. Yes, I I grabbed the camera, but then immediately threw the camera down. I literally and my camera footage is in my showreel. There's literally about three seconds of footage before I throw that camera down. Um, and every time anyone approached us with a video camera, it felt so disrespectful. People here were losing their lives. And anyone that came to us in reporter mode, we were telling them to leave us alone. And it nearly came to fist fights, you know. So there's such passion in that situation that the reporter may be thinking I've got to let the rest of the world see this I've got to let them understand and help but actually when you're in the situation the last thing you want to see is a camera being pointed in your face I, I, I do agree I think I'd like to think my first reaction wouldn't be to get my camera out. I mean I've been in situations and my camera, my my phone, or my camera has come out of my pocket because I'm so busy in the situation. But nothing, nothing obviously like you've experienced. But uh, yeah, how did your husband? What was what was your husband's default kind of core value that popped out? My husband is very practical, um, and his his fault. I mean, he has utilitarian in my words. His core driving force is utilitarian, which is actually extremely practical. So he actually went into practicality mode. So in that split second, everything in our life turned upside down. So anything that had any value, any monetary value, was valueless. So we started and he got it. I mean, he kind of got quite angry in terms of the way that he delivers, you know. So he gets quite in quite um I, what's the word, directive in his instructions, if you know what I mean. Um, but I understand where that comes from. That's all about let's do this, let's let's be practical. So we found ourselves packing things that we could barter with um, in one rucksack, you know, and it wasn't any of the expensive stuff like the video equipment or the cameras or any of that expensive stuff. That was now redundant. Instead, we were using the duty-free fags that we picked up and stuff like that because those were more valuable. We could barter with those if we need to get out or whatever these are things that we can barter with whereas things that have a lot of financial attachment to them just don't seem to have any any relevance anymore so he went into full-on practical mode dressing correctly finding some sturdy you know some sturdy shoes and going out and scouting to find out what the escape rooms were going to be a hundred percent practical and if you do his essence analysis now you will see that his highest driving force is still very very much that practical utilitarian mm. that's interesting i'm just trying to think how i might react because I could, I could see a bit of the practicality kicking in with me but it depending if, if i was my wife i think my default would be supportive of her because i know that she would be extremely vulnerable in that situation and need a lot of support to, to help her focus i think it probably could work to focus on what needs to happen rather than be constrained by fear if you like so i i, I just imagine i would need to be there for her give strength yeah, and I think that you've hit the nail on the head there, Joanne, because the reason that I created this analysis is that we don't know how we're going to behave in that situation. You do not know how you're going to behave in that situation until that situation happens. What I can show people with this analysis is how they are going to 
um, mm -hmm. act. And I guarantee it is proven correct. Every single time that I've tried it, it's proven correct. So I'm so thrilled with what I've created that, you know, I just, this. I felt that I needed to do this, but we never know how we're going to react. Um, and we might think that we've got an idea and we might think we have an idea of how our other half is going to act as well. But when that doesn't happen, that can be the breakdown of the entire relationship. And I've seen it. I've seen it happen with two people that were only just married. They haven't been married long um, and they were each other's world. But the way they reacted in that adversity, it just threw them apart and they never, ever, ever recovered. They end up, ended up divorcing because they just couldn't understand that your initial reaction in that situation is not the be all and end all. You can't judge someone by the way they react. That's their subconscious. You've got to understand it and work with it. But they, but they never did. And, and, you know, they fell apart. Mm. I suppose you see Hollywood playing out that kind of storyline in the movies, isn't it? That you two people find love through the adversity and that the way they both respond is that I'm not trying to trivialize what you're doing, but that's kind of like the emotions we're playing on that we don't know who we are until we get put in a situation where that, that inner self, that essence surfaces itself. Then we have to move out of our standard normal, how we behave in the world to how we behave in adversity or in a unexplained situation. Yeah, and we can't we can't help it. You know, all we can do is understand it and work with it. Um, and that's exactly I know that you've seen my keynote, so you will you'll remember hopefully if I did a good job um, that there is a love story attached to my story because I had been with Stuart for twelve years. And I didn't know if I could trust him. The truth was, you know, I didn't know whether he would be there for me if I really needed it. And that was based on certain evidence, you know, of things that had happened in the past. Um, and, you know, when I had a, a horrendous miscarriage, you know, he it was a shock to both of us. And, and, you know, when he was told he might as well leave the hospital because there's nothing he could do. All I saw was a line of smoke and, and I, I couldn't get hold of him. And because of that. I didn't understand, would I be able to count on him if I needed him? And actually, on the very night of the tsunami, something happened when the tsunami came again. And I watched that man put my life before his. And it was in that moment where I suddenly saw straight through to the core of who he was. And I suddenly understood, yes, if I need him, he's going to be there. Now, I can. I understood that, and we agreed that if we got out of this alive, we were going to do it. We were going to get married, and you know, and and be together forever. And luckily, that's exactly what happened. Um, and I, I love him dearly. And I can look back now that I know him. I can look back to things that have happened. And when we had that miscarriage, understand that he was in as much emotional turmoil and shock as I was. So he was going through his own stuff. It wasn't that he wasn't there for me. So. That test has been put to us. And the beauty of that is that the, the most wonderful love story came out of it. Absolutely. So as, as you're, well, that's, that's wonderful. I mean, that that's truly, truly wonderful. And I'm so pleased that you've, you, you found you're together forever. And that, that's, that is so, so special. And I know that my wife and I have been through some adversity and some challenges in our lives. And we hold that be together forever as our as our kind of mantra that we, we we ask each other, is that still how we feel? And that's that's we keep going back to that because all problems are surmountable if that's your goal. You just gotta somehow put the put the, the day to day challenges aside and focus on the big objective, which is being together forever, you know that kind of like the Disney Up cartoon, isn't it? Where you, you have the, you grow old in rocking chairs, and you're just there until the end of days, and then uh, hopefully pass together. It's kind of our our view of the world. So, how did you find your your essence evolved over the course of this significant tragedy of events that were going on? So, you, you must have you must have gone from one mode to another mode. Over the course of that, the emotions must be coming out. Must have been must have been different. The adrenaline subsides. You've got different needs as you as you grow. So, you you must have seen how you did. You explore in your program here how some of some of these essences are needs driven, and then how then the other ones surface when they're kind of 
after mastering them, if you like? I think it was, um, it's, it's a little bit like being an archaeologist, Joe, because initially I thought I've got to learn about human behaviour, I've got to learn more about human behaviour. And so I dived into becoming a behaviour profiler um, and learning about um, DISC in particular as, as, you know, a measure of people's behaviour and how they act uh, and lots of other ones besides. And I was learning how we behave, how we behave, how we change our behaviour, how we act in certain um, circumstances. But I kept needing to dig further. I wanted to know more than the how. I wanted to know the why. And nothing could give me the why. So I kept digging and digging and digging. And it was only when I came across the understanding of core values that I suddenly realised, ah, I think I've hit the why. What are core values? And I don't use the term core values. I use the term core driving forces. And the reason that I use that term is because core values mean so many different things to different people. And I think the reason that I am really pleased to talk about this on your show is because this is a real cause for concern when we're talking about diversity and inclusion. Because one of the areas where we fail to be diverse and inclusive is when somebody has different core values, she says with her fingers in the air, than ours. We think that if people don't agree with our core values, then that's it, they're enemies of ours, or they don't, they don't, they're an enemy of my core values because they have different core values. And that is the most ridiculous concept. And so I don't call it core values. If I walk into an organization, Joe, and say, do you understand the core values of your people? They will say, yes. They'll say, yes, I I know our core values because it's up there. And they point to the mission statement on the wall. No, that's not what I'm talking about. When you talk about core values, you know, they talk about so many different things that are really not that subconscious driver. So what I'm getting at is what I call the core driving forces of each human being individually. Yeah, and I when I'm working with organisations, you know, part of this forms the the magic of belongingness, where your your true values have an alignment with the organisation. So, if you are a passionate environmentalist, you are passionate about climate change, about sustainability, you will not feel that alignment with an organisation and that sense of belonging, where they don't at least share that as a long term mission. I appreciate it's subtly different to what you're saying there, but there's been an alignment of some, of some, of some really, you know, if you're working for a polluter and you're an environmentalist, there's going to be a disconnect. So at some point there, maybe you need to find a different role or, or the organization's not for you. So there are, there are some values fit that maybe are different to maybe the, the essence that we're talking about. Uh, so, but I think for me, fundamentally, you have to feel an alignment with the passion and purpose of the organization, and then you feel belonging. But I, I agree with what you're saying in terms of the different values that you may have may not necessarily overlap completely with others around you. They don't. And and let me let me explain exactly what we're talking about here, because now we've got to the crux of it. What we're talking about could be explained as core values, but actually what you're talking about is an alignment with the company's mission with what the company stands for. That doesn't have anything to do with our personal essence, our driving force. And this is where we fall apart because people, employers and recruiters and leaders will often say, unless you share my values, I don't want you in my business. Actually, we're talking about two different things. What they're saying is, unless you share my mission, And unless you share my ethics, I don't want you in the business. That's fine. But you can still have different core essences. And the excuse, the the thing that I draw from is my own personal experiences, Joanne. So I always talk about me and Stuart. Stuart and I have been together for almost 30 years now. And I've never been in a job for more than 30 years. So it is a source of, you know, of, of information for me. And I look at our relationship. And if you look at our essence, we are completely opposite to each other. So how then can it work? How can we have such a successful marriage, work together in business so well, be so complementary to each other and be each other's better half if if it's true that you have to share people's values in order to get on? 
it's bollocks, you know, because if you share your essence, then it just makes you flock together. You just have this um, this kind of magnetism towards people that share your core driving forces. But you don't have to share them in order to get on. You can have completely different ones and still understand how to fit together like jigsaw pieces. It can be extremely complementary. I, I completely agree with that. So I, I think it's important sometimes to have a, some difference between you. Yes. The difference that complements, difference that adds, so you become more than just one. You become you become five instead of just two. So because of all these differences, and I think what we end up doing is, if we're, if we're too similar, then maybe we don't have. I don't know. Maybe maybe there's more room for disagreement if we're too aligned. Maybe we have we, we'll share different opinions on our on our similarities, if you like. Whereas we're completely different. We can recognise how we can support each other at different times, and uh, and create create common interests that we we both enjoy in a different way and exactly. I, I know my yeah. i know my wife for example is a is a passionate christmas person whereas and, and she loves the, 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 she loves gifting she loves um wrapping she loves the whole idea of christmas and i'm i'm not anti christmas i'm just not passionate about it in the same way she is but i take joy in seeing her happiness of, of, of giving and being in that environment and it warms my heart to see her happy in that way so i don't have to share her passion but i can i can share the happiness that she has out of her passion and the same way she knows that i do things that i'm passionate about and get happiness and she's there supporting me doing what i do even though it's not what she does so i completely agree we don't have to have the same things that we we value or do or passionate about we just want to but what we are core on is, is, is loving each other for the joy we get out of what we do as individuals. Exactly. And I think in an organisation, if you fill your organisation with people that share your core driving forces, that might be very lovely. But where do you grow? Because when you have people with different core driving forces, that's what is your sanity. You know, Stuart is my sanity. And we're each other's yin and yang in a way. You know, he's my sanity in, virtue, in certain situations and I'm his. Um, but if you look at our report, we're also each other's stressors. So the first time he looked at the his own essence report, he looked at his list of stressors and said, my God, Michelle, it's you. You know, so... So there is there is the uh, that element of it. But if you surround yourself with people with a mix of driving forces, what you get is growth in equal areas. So it's like dropping water into a puddle and watching it expand um, and watching that circumference expand on all areas at once. Um, if you only have people with the same core driving forces as you, it will only expand in one way. So you'll get a you'll get a drip effect rather than the puddle growing and growing evenly. So that's I'm full of these flipping analogies, aren't I, Joanne? But I like seeing things in visual <laughs> terms, and that's what works for me. No, I, 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 I I'm a, I'm a very visual person as well. I, I like to uh, see. Um, the bigger picture, the, the emotions, the, all the all the factors in there. So, no, you're talking. Uh, you, you're talking. You're sharing kind of some of the values I hold dear to me as well, which is uh, being able to project and see bigger pictures this way. So, no, absolutely fantastic. Um, I noticed you were in the RAF. I I was in the RAF when I left school for a few brief years. Yeah. Yes, me too. I only did five years. I joined the RAF on notice engagement. So I was I always had one foot in and one foot out. So rather than having to sign up for 12 years, you can sign up and after your training, once you've done 18 months at any point in time, you can put in 18 months notice or whatever it is. So that was um we got paid less if to have that option, but I'm glad I did because when I joined the forces, I had a very, very strict upbringing um, and I was very sheltered, very used to doing exactly what my dad told me to do. So for me, the forces was easy. Everyone else was struggling with the discipline. I thought it was a walk in the park. What you want about this is freedom. And I loved it and I really excelled. And they actually made me see me woman during my training in front of a whole troop of people that were all older than me. Um, but when my personality started to come out, I realised I'm possibly the last person you want in the forces. I'm so maverick and so disruptive 
and so naughty that I'm probably not the person to be in the forces. So I, I decided to get out and go my own way. What about you? Yeah, I think that was the problem that I had. I was a bit too naughty. Um, <laughs> I, I became incompatible. I did three years as a, a an apprentice technician studying radar and radio communications, so working on uh, fast jets and and slow propellers and those sort of things. So radar and radio, in those days it's all valves and high voltage uh, radar systems. You know, but sort of but you've, just, you've just said something there that makes me think we've got something even more in common. So if you were anything to do with Gris, we'd have been posted at RAF Henlow, both of us. Were you ever at Henlow? No, I, I did my training at RAF Cosford, uh, which is near Wolverhampton, and uh, I didn't get any further. Let's just say that... Uh, I wasn't compatible. Um, I wasn't the person they were looking for. So, yeah, I, I left just at the end of my training. Uh, right. I didn't get if, the, the, yeah, the reason I say that is because RAF Henlow has the ground radio installation unit. So if you carried forward in your trade, you probably would have been posted at Henlow, which is where I was. So who knows? We uh, might have come across each other earlier. I think I, I was more of the air side. So I think I was uh, my, my first posting would have been had I had I escaped training into RF St Morgan down in uh, in Newquay. That yeah, would have been my, beautiful. My post. On um, was it Nimrod's? Mm. No, what were the the early war- the, the AWAC stuff? The early warning. So I think it was Nimrod's. Yeah, that would have been my posting. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was. I, I, we had our fortieth anniversary reunion of joining the other week. So forty years ago, nineteen eighty one, I joined. And that was uh, uh, quite a while ago for me. <laughs> yeah, I think I joined in 85, so not not uh, not dissimilar yeah. times. No, um, I mean, this is an inclusion podcast, so you know, I look back at the changes that have occurred in the forces. You know, it's still illegal to be LGBTQ plus in the forces in those, in those days. People were uh, unceremoniously booted out, dis- disgracefully imprisoned before they left. And I'm, I'm pleased to see that the yeah, certainly our forces in the UK have uh, have recognised that uh, that wasn't fair, and have uh, repatriated people's medals and and, and honour to people that uh, were that were um, forced out. I think mm. it became t- the year 2000, 2000, where it became, um, for want of a better word, allowed to be queer in the forces. And I, I know now many friends who are still serving. Who are trans, openly trans, both trans masculine, trans feminine, and some non-binary people, and I know that the DNI teams in the uh, in the forces, both the Army, Navy, and Air Force, are highly proactive in in terms of LGBT inclusion. So that makes me completely happy. And you know, it's moved but, on a long way, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and I, I look back to when I joined, and you know, women weren't allowed to fly. They said one of the reasons was that it did something horrendous to your womb you know which is ridiculous and also if you got pregnant then you you were you were given a choice you either um get get rid of the uh, offending article um or you leave the forces one or the other all of those things have changed having said that back in 1985 computers were the size of a room so yeah we are old yeah. to, um, you know. <laughs> we were yeah no i, I remember those days well as they had the main computer was in a, a kind of a, a big trailer type thing parked up next to it, next to a hut. Mm. And uh, yeah, that was the computer. And uh, yeah, those, those days are definitely different. And the computers on the, on the, on the, on the fighter jets, you think, well, how do they ever, ever take off and let alone land? But uh, yeah, that was quite clever with just basic electronics, you know, just uh, s- simple logic uh, about how all the, uh, the terrain following radar, the, uh, uh, identification friend or foe all, all those kind of systems work they were very clever without any real advanced technology in them well by our standards today i guess they were advanced in those days so did you do you still harbor back some of the discipline it gave you i mean one of the things i was credit the forces with is the i'm, I'm still quite compliant in nature although I'm quite. I'm rebellious compliant. I don't. I'm not argumentative compliant. I'm kind of rebellious in a su- more subtle way. I mean, I, I love rules. I just don't like following them. So that's my kind of rebellious compliant. But I, I like there to be a rule base that I know that I know that I fit into somehow. I don't know. I can't say the same for me, Joanne. I um. I'm not very good with rules at all. Um. So I think the thing that I learned most about in the Air Force. 
um, was in my basic training and I used to, I, you'll you'll relate to this, I remember being on Amiga, you know, the final kind of big um, push and you're camping out and you're, you know, you're running through the countryside with jerry cans on your back and all sorts of things. Um, and, you know, and, and you can just see the headlines in the newspaper flash up, you know, WRAF pushed beyond her limits, has a heart attack in the middle of the blazing sunshine. And I can see these headlines flashing up in the paper thinking, what are they doing to me? I am going to die any second. And they're going, come on, Mills, you'll get a bee sting if you don't get back. And actually, when you complete it, the love you have for the people that beasted you through it because they broke through that boundary. They showed you that your body can do far more than you ever thought. They show you that your mind can do far more than you ever thought possible. That I will never forget and always be grateful. I was actually taken off the mountain somewhere in Wales in the snow by an ambulance and a, and a, and a I think probably a, a jeep type thing rescued me off this mountain because one of our one of our group was um for whatever reason exhibited some sort of signs of hypothermia started sort of being listless and, and disorientated so what the the commanding officer decided to do was was put this person in a sleeping bag and survival bag and then made everybody else stand around and look at them. So we had nothing else to do. We weren't we weren't keeping warm. So one by one, we all started feeling cold, wet, miserable, demotivated, and sort of. And then all of a sudden, I found myself feeling a bit kind of like out of it. So suddenly, I'm in the I'm in a survival bag in the back of this Land Rover with this other with this other chap, and we were told that they'd radiated through for an ambulance and uh, and, 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 and support. Meanwhile, this group then set off because it's starting to get dark and if they didn't get back, back to camp, they didn't have any torches or anything. So it became kind of one of these unmitigated planning disasters that was going on. I felt a bit sorry for this poor uh, junior officer trying to command us. And so we, we sat in this Land Rover together going, <laughs> freezing cold. Because those, those Land Rovers are pretty exposed. There's no, they weren't sealed, just like a canvasy tent over the top. And suddenly this, this ambulance arrives, and apparently this was the third ambulance. The, the first two are, are in a ditch somewhere down the hill. And so we get, I think we get rushed off to Wrexham Hospital and put on these beds, and they've they got these warm blankets over us and so on. They gave us a good meal. And then what 2 o'clock in the morning, or what, what, no, 12 o'clock at night, yeah, it's really late in the middle of the night. They said, right, you can go now. What do you mean go now? Where are we? <laughs> so... I think we've, we've, we've got someone to phone through to the base or something. And and I just had this brainwave. I said, well, look, let's, just, let's go to the local police station. We've got no money. We've got no Let's go to the police station and say, look, this is our situation. Can you help us? Because I thought forces, police, they must be able to help us. They said, sure, you can keep in one of our interview rooms and we'll sort it out in the morning. So there we were, <laughs> kept in the interview room, had a cup of coffee. And... Uh, in the morning, that they they sent a the sergeant with a car to come and get us and take us back. But yeah, it was, uh, I learned a bit about ingenuity. Of you know, if you turn up at police station, say I'm in the forces, help! They'll put you up, and give you give you a chair to sleep on. <laughs> oh, that's hysterical! But yeah, I think there's a few questions asked about how two young apprentices were kind of abandoned on the side of a mountain in the snow. <laughs> well, you know, it's probably <laughs> yeah, probably uh, trying to. Just your ingenuity, but I think you cheated there, Joanne. There's no other word for it. But there's one thing that I'd love to do, and I'm, I'm making some inroads at the moment. I would love to take people that are coming out of the forces and help them to understand what their essence is, because the whole point of doing this is to help people to be in alignment, to, for them to gain fulfilment. Because what I've learned is that once you understand what your driving forces are, as long as you align to that, as long as you allow your bucket to be filled with, with your core driving force on a regular basis, you achieve fulfillment. And if people that are coming out of the forces, that there's this horrible um, situation when you come out of the forces where you're trying to readjust to Civvy Street and trying to fit in, and there's the horrendous period of feeling a lack of 
um, camaraderie that you so desperately want, you know, and it very nearly got me to join the police, actually, because that's the only place where I could see the same kind of camaraderie. And thank goodness I didn't, because I wouldn't have done well in the police either. Um, so I, I want to help people that are coming out of the forces to understand what truly drives them without other people giving them the rules and regulations. What's 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 there for you and let's help you to find something that fills that bucket up and gives you fulfillment and and helps you to fit you know i, I would love to be able to achieve that i can so relate to that i mean as you, as you know i i found myself about five years ago having not really realized what was going on in my head and i i think it's so true the number of people i've met since i gender transitioned who have said to me, oh, I'm brave, or I, I admire the fact you did this, or I admire the fact that you you had the courage to stop and start again. I, I get the feeling that when I speak to a lot of people, they've never truly sat down and realised who they are, the essence, as you say, that, what their drivers are, what their passions are. They've kind of got on this conveyor belt at when they had to pick their exams at 14 years old or whatever it was, or whatever their parents pushed them into. And this conveyor belt just keeps pushing through life and they don't push the stop button they never get to that gap in the conveyor belt it's like you go to Gatwick airport where you you go from one conveyor walkway to the next walkway you never push the stop button take your luggage off and go actually do I want to go to Mallorca no I don't I, don't, I want to go here instead but people never have that life opportunity because they don't they don't really have that chance to pause and think who am I what do I really want until you get to a point in your life maybe where a disaster occurs or in your late forties, early fifties, you know the the kind of that midlife crisis or that that big thing explodes and you go. Actually, the kids are grown up. I don't know. I don't like my partner anymore. We've never had anything in common, or my life isn't where I want it to be. Why? So I think what you're saying here is about helping people find that that passion, that essence, is it, so valuable because there's so many people in life who don't have that. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And I see essence as being a mirror. Um, I just, you know, people say to me, you know, thank you, Michelle. Essence has given me permission to be myself. And I'm, I think that's the most ridiculous thing to say. All I've done is held up a mirror and you're seeing, you know, you're seeing who you are. And that's what essence does. But I am so passionate about giving this tool to people as young as possible. that I'm currently talking with Employability UK, who has just won the Queen's Award. This is a charity that I work with and I've been a volunteer and ambassador for for several years. And we deal with... Um, um, children that are at school or young adults rather that are at school and they're just about to leave school and transition into the workplace so we're giving them tools um, to be able to make that transition easier and I think it's absolutely essential that you know not only do these people understand what really gives them fire in their belly what a head start that's going to give them Joe. what a tremendous springboard that will give them considering you and I and other people took until they were in their 40s or their 50s or their 60s before they really understood who they were what if we could give that to them earlier yeah i agree I, and i think what i'd like to think is that younger people younger generation are kind of more in touch with their self but in some ways but more distance in other ways because there's so much pressure poor mental health now in the younger generation they may be more aware of their their sexuality or their identity, their heritage, their culture, and more celebrative of each other's. But there's still a lot of pressure to be young today. And I think actually helping people find what their true drivers are is incredibly important. And I think that's that's work that I'd love to see that you, you know, hear you exploring with you know, in terms of employability. Because how much time do we actually invest in our young people in their career development, in their career planning? Yeah, and I'm I'm actually working with I'm I'm working with um two very, very dear friends of mine. So Karen Dempster and Justin Robbins, and we're working together on Kaleidoscope, which is actually a behaviour uh, I call it a navigation tool. It's a navigation tool for children. And we're starting off with 10 to 13 year olds. And once we've proved that within um, education, we're then looking at delivering that to people at an even earlier age. 
So I think my dream would be to get people, uh, to get um, children aged four plus used to understanding about other people's driving forces and their behaviour, how to navigate their relationships at a really early level, because I think that will give them massive tools for the future. That's my ultimate dream. Yeah, I, I would just think that one of the underrated skills is is this emotional intelligence. It's really understanding your own sense of self, how to be present in the moment for conversations, present when you're around people and be able to pick up the nuances of of their needs as well. And if you're both caring about each other's needs emotionally, then those conversations, those relationships build stronger. And I, and I think we don't spend enough time helping children or younger people nurture that human connection. Also, if you think about COVID, that has also created this huge distance between people where we're not truly understanding each other anymore. We're communicating on camera. We know that the, the emotional cues and signals and body language is different on the camera. We can't see what's going on with people's hands, their feet, parts of their expression, what's going on behind them. So, yeah, I think I think thinking now where we are, 2021, there's a new need to help people reconnect themselves and and themselves, I guess, if you've spent 18, 20 months living fairly isolated, working from home, then you've well, got your own emotional needs. I think you're absolutely right, Joanne, but I think one of the key things is the fact that during lockdown, people have had a chance to recalibrate. And what I mean by recalibrate is they've been working from home and therefore their priorities have changed. Now, there's, people are suddenly saying, if you look at, the, at all the research, it's saying that more than 80% of people in the UK do not want to go back to work in the way that it was before. So there are people talking about four day weeks and you know more opportunity to work from home. Why is that? It's because we've been recalibrated. We suddenly realise that the things that are important to us are you know maybe spending more time with our family, maybe doing this, maybe spending more time in nature. Um, and maybe work is not this hamster wheel of be all and end all that we've let it become over the last few decades. So the most important thing for any leader, in my opinion, is to ensure that when their workers come back to work, that they check what are your driving forces? What do you want in order to be fulfilled? And let me, as your employer, ensure that you get that. Because what I'll get back, if I give that to you, what I'll get back will be tenfold. Now, if we can do that and help people understand what's truly driving them now, it can be completely different to what it was before lockdown. If they don't do it, Joanne, the truth is that what they're going to get is they're going to be part of this huge revolution, which is the resignation revolution. And I just wrote an article on that on LinkedIn. We are having so many people resign because they've suddenly decided their job is not giving them what they need in order to be fulfilled. So I ask every leader out there, do you know what your individual employees need from you? Because it's your responsibility as an employer to make sure that they are fulfilled in their working role. And that comes, by the way, sorry, Joanne, I was just going to say that comes from the me who owned the youngest company in the country to ever gain investors in people. So that's my authority for saying, yes, I do know a little bit about what people in an organisation need. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm drawing back to things like the Herzog's model of uh, motivation. When you think about the two, the two stages, we've got the hygiene level and then we've got the motivational factor. You can't motivate people who aren't getting the basic hygiene satisfaction. There's things like um security psychological safety most you know, feeling that they have got a worth etc cetera, etc cetera. we can't motivate people unless the basics are covered i think what people are realizing now is that all along their basic needs to feed what they need their motivational factors weren't being met so it's, employers spend all their time trying to use the motivational factors without understanding the underlying hygiene factors that are causing people to feel distressed with their workplace yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Sorry, there's a slight delay. I didn't mean to talk over you, Joanne. Um, I don't know if you know, but you're telling me what your core driving forces are in everything that you say. 
you know and this is what I say I don't when I when you say what superpower have you got and I say well I can see people's potential I can see people's core driving forces and and the reason I say that is not because I'm psychic not because I'm a witch although I may have been burnt at the stake many many decades ago um it's because I've created essence so I know what I'm looking for and certain things you say Joanne tell me what your core driving forces are and I think you'd be surprised because I think aesthetic is one of your leading core driving forces um, and you've given you've given it away by saying the fact that you need to be emotionally fulfilled the fact that you like to have this elbow room for creativity do things a bit different you care about others so your social is up there as well so you you're caring about you know what your partner needs and all that kind of stuff even before yourself so you're giving me all of these signs that go aruga aruga i know what your core driving forces are and you know i'd love to do this for you as soon as we finish speaking i'd love to do yours for you that sounds like a, a very yeah. I'd love to as well. I know I, I, I'm really curious. I'm I've I've I've, <clears throat> I've had disc profiles. I've had Myers Briggs. I've had psychological profile in the past, and I, I'd love to see what this would come out with because yeah, I'm not I'm not I'm not cynical, but I'm not a an embracer of of psychological traits. So it'd be really interesting just to find out how they resonate with me because. I, you've, you've got me curious now because I listen yeah, to what you've said. I'd, I'd, love your I'd love that. And of course, we both know the wonderful Dr. Linda Shaw. Um, you know, I am a real fan of having one foot in science and one foot in spirituality or openness to anything else. But I love the neuroscience behind this. So the behavior profile I've written, Clarity. Um, that actually embraces all the neuroscience and you know I've, I've got on the wall behind me I have my neuroscience uh, certification from Dr Linda Shaw's course you know uh, as as many of our friends do uh, but I love to understand the neuroscience so what I've done with my in-house neurobiologist is I've written the neuroscience into this so I said this is how we behave but this is how I've measured that this is how I found it and this is how I've measured it and this is what it means from a neuroscience point of view I'm not saying that this is who you have to be what I'm showing you is the bus route that your bus in your brain is taking on a regular basis you can change that bus route all you've got to do is change the stop where the bus stops to pick people up Um, and so I know I'm using one of those childish analogies that I always do but you know I do dumb things down that's the way I do things Um, and it is so easy to see how the neuroscience makes our behavior and how we can change that as well Um, I think it's been more difficult to understand how neuroscience has got anything to do with our core driving forces so the question often has been where do our core drivings come from I think the answer to that Joanne is I know you didn't ask me, but I'm kind of preempting the question. I'll do my own interview here. Um, if you were to ask me, where do our core driving forces come from? I would have to say, I. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I think that they come from our external um, input in our fundamental years. So it does rely on the culture that we're brought up in, the religion, if there is one, um, the, you know, the cultural background, the people that nurture us and look after us, and the people that influence us and, and their views. So it's very, very um, externally validated to a certain extent. But what, what we're taught in those fundamental years in terms of what's right, what's wrong, what's important, those stay with us. They're right at those fundamental years and they stay with us for most of our life. And it's really difficult to change them once they're embedded. So if we understand that someone has different core driving forces, you can say, well, in that case, they must have had a different cultural environment, a different emotional environment, a different financial environment, a different religious environment in order for those to happen. So it doesn't matter why those core values are different. Um, It just matters that we understand that they're different and we learn to work with them. I, I completely agree. I, I can trace a lot of my limiting beliefs and my need for validation and to be and to please somebody back to my father. You know, he I was always never good enough. I was always 
the one that um, was told that I, I, sh I, sh I should redo something again and again and again, uh, whether that was my father's 22 years in the Navy or whether it was when he became a teacher. I don't know, but I, I often felt like his pupil f failing the test. So, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree that a lot of my insecurities and need to please come from the way I was brought up in that way. And uh, I still find myself fighting that programming I was given, knowing full well that that's where it's come from. Well, that's, that's why I believe those insecurities are arisen from. And even though you know, you still can't switch off that critic. You can't, still can't switch off that little nag in your head all the time. So, yeah, I completely agree that a lot of these things are very foundational. And I think what you've just triggered there for me, Joanne, is really important because I look at what I do and some people will say, well, why don't you use Myers-Briggs? Why don't you use this motivation tool? Why don't you use this, that and the other? Why have you had to create your own? And I look back and think, why? And it's again, this is all about the why do I do what I do? Why am I the way I am? And I remember the six or seven year old me queuing to wait to have their go to climb the oak tree. And when I got to the front of the queue, the older boys had knocked nails into the trunk of that oak tree to make it easier for the smaller children to be able to climb um, up the trunk of the tree and into the branches. And when it was my turn, I'd say, no, thank you. And I'd go to the other side of the oak tree and make my own way up without the nails in. Why did I do that? Do you know what, Joe? I have no idea. But I'll tell you one thing, when I did it myself, the view from the top was twice as good. And for me, when I look at something and think, well, why should I use somebody else's tool? Why should I create my own? Mine is better. Mine actually captures everything I want it to capture. And I therefore think it is better. I think the view is sweeter when I've created it myself. And it's up to other people which one they use. I can't help that individualistic streak. It doesn't mean that I'm unsociable. It doesn't mean that I'm unkind. It just means that I have this drive to create things myself. I can't help it. So what do I do? I embrace it. Completely, completely agree. I'm, I'm very similar. I don't like quoting other people. I don't like using other people's materials. I want to have original thought. I want people to interact with me for me, not not my ability to repeat others. So, yeah, I completely agree with, with that concept of originating and being one's own kind of author, if you like. Yeah, no, I, I respect that. So I think, you know, people look at my uh, my clarity analysis, which is it's based on the theory of DISC. Um, but people say, why have you created a DISC analysis? It's the same as everyone else's. I'll tell you what, it flipping isn't. It is so much more in-depth than most other profiles that I've come across. It's got the neuroscience built into it. It's using, and I've written every single word myself. I've written every single question myself. The algorithms, how the answers are reproduced, all of that. I've done it all myself. So although I've used the theory of DISC, it's nothing more than that open source information from William Walter Marsden back in the 1920s. It's just the theory. Every single bit has been written by me. In terms of essence, I've used the theory from Edward Spranger, from his book, Types of Men. And all that is, is six different umbrellas. And what I've done is I've taken all my work in values and I've helped slot that into the theory that Edward Spranger created because it makes it easier for us to measure ourselves against each other and in society in general. So I have borrowed from the theory and given lots of credit to the fact that I've borrowed from that theory. But every single word, every single meaning, every single question has been designed by me and orchestrated by me and so have the results. Well, I can't believe we've been chatting away for an hour now. This is absolutely fantastic. I'm sure the listeners who are listening in would love to find out more about your clarity, your kaleidoscope and your essence programs. Uh, where can people get hold of you? The easiest way to get hold of me, Joanne, is on LinkedIn. Um, and if you don't use LinkedIn, then use Facebook, use social media. There's only one Michelle Mills Porter. Mills Porter's hyphenated. And I'm the only one on the planet, which really fits my need for individualistic core driving forces. 
So uh, there's only one me. If you look at Michelle Mills Porter, I will come up. If you reach out to me, please tell me that you've reached out to me because you heard the podcast and I will accept you straight away and be thrilled to start a conversation. Um, if it's on Facebook or, you know, through the website, any way you want to get hold of me, just let me know that it's because you've seen me on the podcast. And that way I'll know how to filter you out from the myriad of people that want to tell me that I'm the most beautiful woman they've ever seen and I'm really sexy and would I be their friend? Well, that goes without saying, obviously. Well, you know the type, Joanne. You get them on Facebook. I've only had, I've had two this morning. They're usually from, you know, um, people in the forces in America or stuff like this, and they're obviously yeah. fake profiles. But they always tell you how beautiful you are. Five star generals. <laughs> five star. Five star generals. They were in Afghanistan in the day, but now they're not. But yeah, I, I never thought. Yeah. So you work with organize. You work with organisations and also individuals. Is that right? I do. I tend to work with organisations, but to be honest with you, I'm really good at helping leaders to understand their people, to engage with them better. And that's all about performance for the organisation. But secretly, where I'm getting my kick is all the individual people I'm working with that are going, oh my gosh, is that me? Oh, wow. And I'm empowering them. So, you know, I'm actually, even when I'm working for organisations, it's the work that I'm doing one-to-one with their people that really fires me up and gives me those little bursts of everything I need for my fulfillment you know people saying wow I'm empowered I feel powerful I'm going to go out there and knock it out of the park fantastic well I'm looking forward to uh having a conversation with you about, with you about my clarity profile um soon um and I'm sure the listener will get hold of you as you say google you Michelle Mills hyphen porter uh you've got a website mmpuk.com we can find you there as well but linked it's a great place to start so thank you, Michelle, for being here today. And a huge thank you to you, the listeners, for tuning in and listening and getting this far. And uh, thank you so much. Please do subscribe, if you're not a subscriber already, to keep updates on future episodes of the Inclusion Bites podcast. That's B-I-T-E-S. Tell your friends and colleagues and share the love. I have a number of exciting guests lined up over the next few weeks and months. So please, please, please stay in touch and stay subscribed. And of course, if you'd like to be a guest, then please do drop me a line to joe.lockwood at cchangehappen.co.uk. And also, if you've got any ideas on how I can improve or other guests that may be suitable, then please do let me know. So finally, my name is Joanne Lockwood, and it's been an absolute pleasure to host this podcast for you today. Catch you next time. Bye.